All right, hello everybody, and thank you very much for coming to CU Boulder and to MCDB. And if you happen to have come to our first annual um, community lecture last year, then I welcome you back. And so my name's Lee Nicewander. I'm the chair of MCDB. And those letters, that's quite a mouthful. It stands for Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology. So this today marks our second annual public lecture that's co-hosted by MCDB and our friends up in the mountain, the Keystone Symposium on Molecular and Cellular Biology. And what's really exciting is this is our second one, which is really almost a trend, right? So I hope you like it and enjoy it and then hope you come back next year when we do this again. All right, so I don't want to take a lot of time and keep us from the main event, but I really don't oftentimes get a captive audience of people from outside the department. And so I'd like to share with you some of the highlights uh, that we've had in the past year and some of, a couple of our future directions. And so the first exciting news that I have had just happened last week. And so MCDB has distinguished researchers and on our faculty, and Professor Emeritus Norm Pace is literally a distinguished professor. It's a title that was bestowed to him by the University of Colorado. And it's the highest title that a faculty member can have. And Dr. Pace has actually made two and three you know, exciting discoveries that are truly uh, innovative and worthy of their own Nobel Prize. And we could devote an entire symposium just to his contributions. And in fact, there was a symposium. We called it the Normposium uh, a few years ago in honor of his retirement. So you've all probably heard of the human microbiome and the multitudes of microbes that live in and on our body. And so, in fact, every plant, animal, and environmental habitat contains its own unique microbiome. And we've come to realize that these microbiomes exert profound influences on our organisms that they live on. And so to make a long story short, our own Norm Pace uh, is considered the father of microbiomics, or the father of microbial ecology. Or, as the science writer Ed Young put it a few years ago in The Atlantic, the, the guy who blew the doors off the microbial world. And so Dr. Pace and his students developed the methods by which all researchers around the world study different microbiomes. And then last week, the National Academy of Sciences awarded the Stanley Miller Medal, which is awarded once every five years, and they awarded it to Norm Pace. So everything I told you about his pioneering work in, on the field of microbiome is only half of the citation for the Stanley Miller Medal. So the other half is in another amazing story in and of itself. So we're so lucky to have Norm in our department and we're lucky to have Norm and his wife, Bernadette, here with us today in the audience. So would you please stand up so that we can recognize your accomplishments? So as I mentioned, our department's filled with amazing researchers. And I wanted to tell you about a few more of the honors that our faculty have earned over this past year. So last year, I told the audience about Gia Volz, whose lab has uncovered a, the cellular component called the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. And we learned about this in high school, but it turns out we didn't really even know half of what the ER actually does. And so this year, Gia became an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute which is perhaps the premier um, biomedical in research institute. And so fortunately for us, HHMI pays for her and funds her research, and yet we get to keep her here in MCDB. So, um, so Zoe Donaldson is an assistant professor in MCDB, and she just arrived just a few years ago, but she really hit the ground running. And Zoe studies the neurobiology of a complex behavior in mammals, such as pair bonding, or what we know of as love, 
and grief and the resilience from loss. And just in the past year, Zoe has garnered a slew of prestigious awards, including a National Institutes of Health New Innovators Award, the National Science Foundation Edge Award, the Frank Beach Award in Behavioral Neuroendocrinology, and the 2019 International Behavioral and Neurogenetics Society Young Scientist Award. As well, and not to mention the most diabolical murder, at which she won for her plot at the Austin Film Festival. So you also may not realize that um, MCB is renowned for our biological research, but also for our leadership in education and educational research. And Professor Jenny Knight is a major force behind this leadership. So Jenny was trained as a neurobiologist and a developmental biologist, but about 20 years ago, she decided to devote her career to, um, to edu education and educational research. And she's won many awards, and we're happy that this year she added the CU Boulder's Best, Best Should Teach Gold Award for her outstanding teaching. And I know that some of her students are here in the audience, and they can attest to her amazing teaching. And so my last boast is MCDB is blessed with many um, beloved educators, and um, Dr. Nancy Guile is one of the most beloved. And so much so that last year, one of her former students, um, Dr. Alexander Meininger, decided to surprise and honor Dr. Guile with an, uh, by establishing an undergraduate educational scholarship called the Nancy Guile PhD Endowed Scholarship Fund. And so what better honor could that be? So I, I hope I haven't left you with the impression that the department just revolves around the faculty because our students, the undergraduates and, uh, and graduate students are really important in, in our role and our mission here. And so I could spend the next hour talking about the awesome students, but you didn't come here there for that. And so just one recent item that I'm particularly proud of is that every other year our graduate students um, organize and host a scientific symposium entirely on their own. And they invite top students from around the country to speak on a particular theme that the students have voted on. And two weeks ago, we had a fantastic symposium on an emerging and how emerging topics and news drive science in the lab. And so I, I hope you can appreciate that there's no one-way flow of knowledge in MCDB and that all of us, the faculty, the graduate students, and the undergraduates, we're all scientific colleagues who discover together how life works. And then I've highlighted some of our achievements, but I don't want you to leave thinking that MCDB is only looking inward, because indeed we support education and research across the campus. More than 1,700 students enroll in our, course, in our courses each semester, and almost half of those students and credit hours were taken by non-majors. And MCDB provides research experience through real-world, hypothesis-driven research lab courses. And again, this is not just for MCDB majors, as more than half of the students come from other life science majors. And finally, we're also building a new facility that's going to be available for everyone across the campus to do cutting edge research in stem cell biology, which is revolutionary, revolutionizing our understanding of health and disease. And so with that, I've definitely spoken long enough, um, but it's my great pleasure to introduce our partners in this new public event, the Keystone Symposium on Molecular and, and Cellular Biology. And the Keystone Symposium have had an enormous impact on life science research from its beginnings in the 1970s. And so to tell you about that, I'm extremely pleased to welcome Thale Jarvis, the Chief Scientific Officer for the Keystone Symposia. Thanks so much, Lee. And um, we're really, really pleased to be here um, in the second year of our um, joint efforts to bring really fascinating science to the Boulder community and to the worldwide community as we're streaming this event and it'll be available in an archival form on YouTube going forward. So thank you everyone for coming. It's my pleasure 
um, to welcome our speaker today. I don't have a slide deck, so um, I'll just tell you very briefly about a little bit about Keystone Symposia for those of you who don't know. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization, um, one of the leading organizations to convene scientific conferences in the biological sciences, um, which we've been doing for nearly 50 years, not quite as long as MCDB, which just celebrated their 50th anniversary this past year. Um, but um, we're headquartered up in Silverthorne, Colorado. Um, many of our conferences um, are, occur in Colorado, although we now convene conferences around the world. Um, still about a third of our scientific programming occurs in Colorado. Um, we bring probably about 5,000 scientists uh, from around the world to Colorado every year. Many of those conferences are, are up in the mountains um, at Keystone Resort and at Breckenridge, sometimes at Steamboat. We actually will be holding our, our first conference in Boulder next year. Uh, we're very excited to add Boulder to our list of, of sites for our scientific conferences. Now, most of those conferences, they're, they're full-length, multi-day conferences, and, and the audience are, are professional scientists. But what we've started to do in partnership with MCDB is to invite some of those speakers to speak to the, sci to the lay community about the science um, that they're bringing. So Dr. Arjun Rosh has... Um, has very graciously agreed um, to come a little bit early. Um, he's going to be speaking at a con conference of ours up in Keystone um, starting tomorrow. Um, but he's come to Boulder um, to share some of his, his science with you. So as a brief introduction to his background, um, Dr. Raj um, went to UC Berkeley where he majored, double majored in math and physics. Um, from there he went on to NYU where he got a degree, PhD degree in mathematics. Um, and then he did a postdoc at MIT in, MIT in uh, physics and biology. He now serves as an associate professor at University of Pennsylvania and he's in the Department of Bioengineering and also in the Department of Genetics and the Perelman School of Medicine. Um, his, his research is, is really interesting. As you probably garnered from his background, he comes from a, a, a very highly educated uh, physical science and mathematics background. Um, and, and that's a really fertile space where, where we're seeing a lot of fascinating applications come into biology where people are bringing highly quantitative uh, physical measurements and bringing them to bear on biological systems. And, and his work is really fun, uh, focusing on, on some of the advances in um, single cell biology and trying to take those and, and really elucidate cellular function in a revolutionary way. Um, so he's going to be giving our lecture today. Before he takes, takes the podium, I did also want to mention um, that there's going to be a reception afterwards, and we would welcome everybody um, to attend that. And I also wanted to call out um, Keystone Symposia has a new chief executive officer. Uh, Debbie Johnson has just joined us, and uh, we really welcome her to our organization. She's here today, and I'm sure she would love to talk to anyone who's interested in learning more about our initiatives, in, including some, some additional initiatives in science education. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Raj. Thanks. OK, so, um, so thank you all for coming. And thanks to Keystone Symposia and MCDB. Uh, thank you both very much for inviting me um, for actually what is my first public talk. And um, it's interesting because I think the standard advice in a public talk is you know, imagine you're giving your talk to your parents. And my parents are actually here, <laughs> as well as my brother and my sister and my brother-in-law. And um, you know, you'd think that helped, but I'm not so sure. Um, my mom told me this morning, she's like, I'm going to ask you a question. Although it's more of a comment than a question. That's what she actually said. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, so, that's, uh, so we'll see. Um, OK, so I just wanted to actually start by thanking all the people in my lab who actually do all the work in the lab uh, to make all the results that I get to run around and talk about and tell you about. Uh, I'm just really, really blessed to work with this spectacular team of people who are just really, really talented. So, um, so I'm, I'm really, really happy to work with them. 
Okay, so, uh, so the title of my talk was Do Cancer Cells Have Free Will? Um, you're probably wondering, what does that mean? Um, what is the question that we're trying to solve? I, the question that we are very interested in solving, very practically speaking, is you know, how are we going to cure cancer? And I would say that we're very, very good at curing 99% of cancer. And I don't mean 99% of cancers, I mean 99% of cancer. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So, uh, so here's an example of a patient with advanced metastatic melanoma. This is not good, all right? They've got tumors all over the place. This is, this is a bad situation. Um, and then what has happened over the last several years is people have developed these uh, advanced targeted therapies, like sort of these silver bullet miracle drugs that can actually get rid of almost all of these tumors. I mean, you look at this and it looks like this patient is, is cured. I mean, this is, and I should say, this is an amazing advance that, uh, that you know, we're able to do this for metastatic melanoma, which used to be you know, uh, really bad. Um, the big problem is that when you wait a few weeks or months later, uh, the tumors come back. And this is the real, what this is suggesting, and they come back in the same places. So what this is suggesting is that while this drug is able to kill almost all the tumor, some small percentage of those cells, 1%, maybe 0.01% maybe of those cells, somehow remain and they go on to uh, cause disease relapse. So that's the thing that we really want to solve. Now, uh, solving this in, in patients is obviously challenging, involves a lot of different things. Fortunately for us, um, we can sort of study this by taking cells actually from patients and growing them in a dish and studying them in the lab. So uh, I'll give you an example right here of exactly this sort of this problem of drug resistance. So, so here we have a bunch of these metastatic melanoma cells. I'm going to now play this movie and you'll see them dividing. So the cells are dividing uh, sort of at will, uncontrollably dividing. This is the problem of cancer. You've got cells that just won't stop dividing and they, they form these tumors. Um, and I've stopped this video at a particular place. You can look over here, you can see there are these two cells that just divided. So these two cells are about as similar as two cells can be. And then what we're gonna do is add drug to these cells and see what happens. So we're gonna add this miracle drug that should kill off all these cells and let's see what happens to, uh, to all of these cells, but in particular these two. So add the drug and what happens, so I'm gonna pause it right here after a couple of days of drug treatment, what you can see is that most of these cells are kind of strung out and spindly, they're unhappy, and they'll go on to die. The drug is working on those cells, it's killing those cells. Uh, but if you pay close attention to the fate of those two cells that just divided, these two sister cells, you can see that, well, one of these cells is just like the others. It, it looks like it's on its way to death, so this, this guy's dying off. But the other cell actually somehow not only survived, but underwent another cell division which is kind of like what we would expect in these like drug resistant, uh, drug resistant tumors that I showed you earlier. And in fact, if you play this video for another couple of weeks and watch what happens here, you can see that those two cells keep on dividing and eventually form this little colony of resistant cells, of cells that are resistant to the drug. And I should say that actually this, you have to look around a lot to find this particular place on the dish where the cells do this because you can grow, uh, you know, this happens in one in many, many thousands of cells. So you have to take pictures of tens of thousands of cells in this video to find this one little place where this happens, but it does happen. There's this, uh, something happened to one particular cell that caused it to become drug resistant. And now um, the question that we have is, what is different about these two cells? How does it, is there a decision that the cell makes or is it a foregone conclusion? Is there, do these cells essentially have free will or is there something about these two, different about this top cell as compared to the bottom cell that allowed it to survive once we added that drug to it? Um, and in fact, so I'm gonna take a step back from here and just say that one of the things I love about science is this idea that, um, Sometimes everything tells you that uh, what's happening to the cell or what's happening in your data is fitting theory A. But when it, if you look at little hints along the way, 
It's actually saying maybe something else is going on here. And this is really, I think cancer is a field that's replete with examples of this. And I'll take you, in fact, in the origin of cancer, like what causes cancer, um, I think is filled with these kinds of stories. And it's actually, uh, you know, how many people have seen this movie, The Sixth Sense? Anybody seen this movie? Okay, I'm gonna spoil the ending for those of you who haven't seen it, but it's, it's old enough now that, look, if you, I can't help you if you haven't seen it. So anyway, it's this movie about uh, a man who doesn't know that he's dead, okay? He's a ghost and he's actually sort of going through his life. Here he's actually um, a ghost having uh, dinner with his wife. And as you're watching, this is only revealed at the end. And all through the movie, um, it looks like he's actually having dinner with his wife and you know, they're having some kind of issues because <laughs> they're not really communicating very well. Um, and if you look though carefully, you can see, look, she's the only one eating. There are all these little clues left along the way that he's actually dead but you just don't know until the end. And now all of a sudden you look back and you're like, oh, that makes sense. Cancer is filled with these kinds of things. So, you know, actually at the very beginning of cancer, you know, you've been around for a long time, cancer, uh, people thought that cancer was caused by, let's say, a foreign object implanting into your body and that would grow. And that was, it was actually an exogenous agent. It was only uh, relatively recently that people realized that, no, it's actually from your own cells that cancer arises, actually. Some of the first, uh, so then, you know, what causes those cells to become cancers, to divide like those ones I showed you on the dish? So these are actually some really famous experiments from um, Yamagiwa Katsusaburo from the very early 1900s, where what he did is he would paint tar repeatedly on rabbit ears. And what he found is that he could actually induce tumors on these rabbit ears. The idea being that these exogenous agents could induce your own cells to become cancer. Um, the big problem was that actually around that time or a little later, uh, this guy named Johannes Fibiger came up with this spirochete theory that all of cancer was caused by these parasites called spirochetes. And this uh, idea really took hold and everyone was like, oh, it's spir and they had spirochete fever. Um, and then uh, it turned out that that was all like some sort of artifact. And it was all kind of debunked. I mean, he won the Nobel Prize, but then, and then this whole area sort of went dormant. And these ideas of uh, Katsusaburo were sort of forgotten. The same time, or well, a bit later, uh, there's the story of Peyton Rouse, uh, famous for Rouse sarcoma virus. So he was a scientist at Rockefeller University. And um, actually, a, a chicken farmer from Long Island came in with his prize hen uh, and said, you know, here, I've got, this is my prize hen. It's got this huge tumor on it. Can you do anything? And he said, yeah, yeah, give it to me. And said, kill the chicken. Um, <laughs> took out the tumor. And he did this very interesting experiment where you could take this tumor, um, grind it up, and inject it into another chicken, and that other chicken would actually grow a tumor. And you could do this repeatedly. You could sort of serially transfer the, um, the, the cancer. And it turned out what he would do is he'd run this through filters and so forth, filtering out different, like what is it that he's injecting? Um, and it turned out to be a virus. And this actually informed then cancer research for many, many years. In fact, in the, when they declared the war on cancer, everybody thought, oh, you know, what we need to do is figure out all these cancer viruses, which of course, explains nothing about the experiments that um, Katsusaburo did in the early 1900s. Uh, and now it seems sort of silly to think that viruses cause all cancers, although they do, they do cause some. Um, so then what happened, uh, but you know, so that was sort of dominating things for a long time. Then actually Bob Weinberg, who's a famous scientist at MIT, uh, he actually, um, really changed, I think, how we think about this. So uh, what he did is these are actually cells grown in a dish now. So this is actually, by the way, a huge reduction of the problem of cancer. Instead of looking at uh, you know, rabbits or hens or whatever, he's looking at cells growing in a dish. So it's a massive simplification that allows you to hopefully pin down what's going on. And what he, uh, so there's actually this famous story that uh, he was walking across the River Charles on a blustery evening. Um, of course, it was blustery. And as he was walking, he was, he was thinking about, you know, well, um, what if it's genes that cause cancer, not viruses or anything else, but maybe mutations to our own genes, little errors that could actually cause cells to become cancerous. So, uh, so then they did these sets of experiments where they could actually take genes from cancer cells, 
put them into non-cancer cells and turn them cancerous. Now there's actually, so you know, there's this idea, I think, in science of this sort of lone genius of science, oh, they had this brilliant insight. Um, it's actually very interesting. So at around the time that uh, Bob Weinberg was doing these, uh, doing these experiments, word was out in his department of this guy named Demetrios Spandidos. Has anybody heard of Spandidos? So Demetrios, oh, okay, one person. So, so Demetrios Spandidos was a researcher um, working in, in Canada at the time, and everybody was whispering, oh, you know, Spandidos, he has these amazing results. And you know, Bob Weinberg uh, learned that actually what Spandidos had been doing was exactly this and had all these amazing results and was you know, giving these amazing talks. And you know, obviously Weinberg was <laughs> getting a little upset about all this. Uh, and then it turned out, so apparently, uh, Spandidos submitted his paper for publication at one of the very top uh, journals. And one of the reviewers, apparently Richard Axel, I'm not sure, but uh, one of the reviewers, uh, I believe, wrote in and said, well, I have done some sort of calculation, and the amount of lab plastic required to have done the experiments outlined in this paper is more than the entire amount of lab plastic used by Canada last year. And so that suggested that this entire thing was just a fraud or just messed up or whatever. And uh, so Spendidos went down in flame. Bob Weinberg is now very famous. <laughs> um, <laughs> where were the breaks? So anyways, I think Spendidos maintains his innocence to this day. But you know, anyway. Um, anyway, the amazing discovery was that, yes, indeed, uh, genetic differences, genetic mutations can cause cancer. And in fact, you know, one of the crowning achievements is they could actually find the letter Right? The letter in the genetic code that caused cancer to occur. I mean, here are all the letters, and this one changes, and that causes cancer, uh, which is kind of an amazing thing. And I should say that this uh, genetic determinism, this idea that this little mistake leads you inexorably to cancer, has taken root in the cancer biology field. This is how we think about cancer, uh, is through the lens of genetics. Um, and in fact, these days, I mean, we live in this age of genetic determinism, 23andMe, your genes are your destiny, this is just, you know, how it works and don't bother trying to do anything else. Um, so I think it's very natural to assume, and I think many people have, that the difference between these two cells, this life or death decision or difference, is due to genetics, that there's some mutation going on in this cell that allowed it to survive and the other one so that's why it died. It didn't have that mutation. And certainly from the 30,000 foot view, this sort of fits everything. So if you have mutations, you think of Darwinian selection. So you have a, a patient with you know, a lot of tumor cells. They have some mutants in there. You kill them all off with a drug, and then those mutants continue to grow and survive and uh, you know, repopulate these tumors. It looks exactly like Darwinian selection. Um, and in fact, uh, these sorts of this sort of mutational selection thing definitely happens. I'll give you a beautiful example from um, uh, this is actually Michael Baim at, at Harvard. Uh, he did this beautiful experiments um, adding, looking at bacterial resistance. So basically what he's done here um, is he's growing a bunch of bacteria on this uh, huge agar slab. And these bacteria run up against antibiotic. So there are these lines of antibiotic here. And then what you find are these occasional rare mutants that occur, and they can actually grow in that antibiotic. And then there are increasing levels of antibiotic here. And I'll speed this movie up a little bit. Um, and what you can see is that the cells stop there. They stop at these uh, in levels of antibiotic. And then rare mutations allow them to go through. And so people, you know, it's pretty reasonable to assume that if you have rare cells surviving some kind of drug, that it must be some sort of mutation. And in fact, there's classic experiments from Luria and Delbrook. I don't know how many people, well, Luria and Delbrook, a okay, fair number of people. Um, beautiful exper experiments from the early 40s. This is even before they had DNA, where they asked exactly this kind of question. They asked, why is it that some bacteria live um, and some bacteria die, is it something you know, genetic or transmissible, like heritable? Uh, so they did this experiment, it's really beautiful. I mean, this was the days when you could just you know, win a Nobel Prize by growing some cells in test tubes and counting the number of spots. <laughs> <laughs> Not the case anymore. Anyway, um, so this is an outline of their experiment. They have, uh, let's take the case of kangaroos, and you can find these rare albino kangaroos. They do exist. Uh, they tend to get eaten. 
<laughs> but let's pretend they <laughs> let's pretend they don't get eaten. Um, but let's say we took these kangaroos and s sort of seeded them in different countries. We just put one in these various countries, and then let's let them proliferate. Okay, so what would happen is that these kangaroos would start to proliferate. But let's say one got a mutation and made it an albino. Then as they keep proliferating and doubling, remember it's exponential growth. They keep doubling and doubling. What you'd find is a whole bunch of albino kangaroos in this country, and fewer in this country, and maybe none in this country. You'd find a huge variability in the number of albino kangaroos that you would find. Okay? And this is uh, the experiment, the less colorfully done with bacteria, um, but this is actually, I think, my favorite table in all of biomedical science. So um, this is where they did exactly this. So they basically put bacteria in all these different uh, test tubes and counted the number of mutants that showed up, um, and they found this huge variability. I mean, one, zero, zero, six, whatever, 107. They'd find this huge variability. And if you do a statistical analysis, what that showed is that it's genetic. And so everything sort of points to these, you know, rare mutate, rare behaviors of cells as being uh, as being genetic, but maybe that's not what's going on here. Maybe that's just sort of uh, our view of it looking forward. But maybe there's alternative explanations for this. Um, and so uh, while drug resistance looks like this case of Darwinian selection, uh, we actually did these Luria-Delbruck experiments in lab. I'm not going to show you all the data. Um, but the point is, what you find is that it's not genetic. You can even sequence these cells. What you find is that there's no genetic difference between them. They're basically the same. There's no relevant genetic difference between these two cells. So it must be something else. There must be something else different about these cells. And the question here is really that of then, well, do they have free will? Do they just decide uh, to, well, I'm going to, you know, just like, my, well, today I'll have cornflakes. Well, maybe this cell says, maybe I'll just uh, decide to live and survive the drug. Um, so I think that for uh, what I will talk about today is really not free will, free will in the sense of the sort of philosophical thing, but sort of more a practical level of free will, which is, is there something I could tell you about this cell before we add the drug? that would predict that it would somehow survive? Is there something I can measure about this cell? So on a practical level, can I determine its fate, uh, even though I know it's not genetic, but is there something else? And I think that, you know, again, in this sort of uh, genetically determined world that we live in, um, it's pretty easy to forget that there are many layers of biology on top of just the genetics, on top of just these uh, genetic differences. And actually, we are embodiments of exactly this. Uh, so we all start, all of us started from one cell uh, that then divided repeatedly um, to form, you know, trillions of times to form all the different cells in our body. Now, all of the cells in our body have the same genetic code. They're all running the same program. But I've got, you know, fat cells, smooth muscle, muscle cells, blood cells, nerve cells, all different kinds of cells. So all of these cells in my body are doing different things even though they have the same DNA. So you can have different behaviors from the same, uh, from the same uh, genetics. OK, um, so how do cells know to be muscle cells versus fat cells versus intestinal cells? How do uh, these cells make those decisions? And the answer is in the uh, what's called sort of the epigenetics, or how the cells read out those genes. So it turns out that some cells are going to read out, like so maybe your muscle cells will read out a bunch of muscle genes that do muscle things. And maybe uh, their fat cells pull out different recipes out of the DNA recipe book and decide that they're going to make fat genes that make them into fat cells. And this program by which certain cells pick out certain things to do out of the genome is really what epigenetics is all about. And it's sort of another layer that now I think we have to consider. Um, and I think actually uh, one of the amazing things that has happened over the last, let's say, 15, 20 years is that we now have the ability to actually visualize within a single cell the process of reading out these different genes. So we could look inside of a cell. So here's a one particular cell, a fibroblast. Um, doesn't particularly matter what. But um, here are the two copies of one of the chromosomes. So this is the cell's nucleus, or its brain center, where all the DNA is. Within there, there's actually two different uh, copies of your chromosome. So one's maternal, one's paternal. And at the end of this chromosome is a gene and on, that gene in this particular type of cell is active. And in fact, 
uh, all of these little spots that you see coming out of that particular uh, dot right there, all of these spots are sort of the products of the gene activity. It tells us that the gene are on. So all of these dots are messenger RNA molecules that are being transcribed from that gene. Um, and if we looked in another kind of cell, it might not be expressing that gene. Different kinds of cells are going to turn on different genes, and that's another layer by which cells can achieve different outcomes even though they have the same DNA. Okay, so um, one thing that's very interesting about this though, so you know, look, people have been, I'm not saying this is brand new, and people have been studying uh, this epigenetic layer of uh, biological regulation for a very long time, but typically this is thought to be pretty much permanent. So once you have a cell that's a muscle cell, it's not going to turn into an uh, intestinal cell or a skin cell. Once a cell is sort of locked in a bunch of switches, it's kind of stuck in those, having those sets of switches on or off. And the, um, another cell type has a different set of switches, but they're not going to just randomly uh, flip back and forth between each other. Um, but what we were wondering is, okay, look, when we're growing these cells in the dish, they're all exactly the same. We start with one cell growing in the dish that forms all these cells, then we add drug, and only one of those cells ends up uh, being resistant to drugs. So what that says is that somewhere a cell flipped, even though it's a melanoma cell, it somehow flipped to become a different kind of melanoma cell that's somehow resistant to the drug. And the question is, how do cells do the, what, what are they flipping on and off? I mean, we look at these cells, they all look the same, but if we peel back this layer um, and look at the sort of gene regulation, can we actually see differences between these cells that should otherwise be exactly the same? And the answer is yes. So, uh, you know, we and many other people have been studying this sort of thing for quite a long time now, um, where if you look inside of otherwise identical cells, so these are a bunch of cells growing again in a dish and they're all, seemingly exactly the same, but if you look at the activity of these genes, you'll find that some cells have a whole lot of these genes, some cells have very little gene activity. The activity can vary widely from cell to cell. And what we found was that if you look around in a very large number of these melanoma cells, you'll find these genes, like particular genes, whose variability actually predicts whether that cell is going to be cancerous or resistant to drug or not. So what that's saying is that it's not just free will. We can actually tell. It's sort of like if a person, uh, I'm sure you've heard this research where uh, people, their neurons are already firing to make a decision before they even uh, consciously are aware of making a decision. And it's like that with these cells. We can kind of look at the cell and say, oh yeah, you're going to be resistant already. Uh, it's a non-genetic determinism, if you will. And using this, uh, which I think is quite interesting, I'll, I'll show you more about this later, I think that that actually allows us potentially to uh, approach the problem of treating resistance in a different way. So, and in fact, one of the key differences between um, this and a uh, genetic basis of resistance is that cells can move back and forth. So here's an example of a cell, uh, these mel melanoma cells growing, and we've actually labeled the, this, they're growing in real time. Um, we've labeled one of these uh, uh, genes, one of the genes with this green color, and what you can see is that there are these rare cells that turn on, so they decide to turn on this gene and become green, and then they can even turn it back off. So they'll turn on and off this gene. So instead of, be, this would be like, you know, oh, I've got the genes for blue eyes, and then one day I wake up and I have brown eyes, and then wake up a little bit later and I got back to blue eyes. I mean, it's like, that doesn't happen, but it can happen in this situation. Um, and in fact, just to underscore the fact that this is important for, uh, for drug resistance, so it's not the awesomest movie, but it'll hopefully show up here okay. So here are a bunch of cells growing, again with that same gene labeled. And you can see here were some cells that were on and then they start turning off. So they were on, they start turning off. And here's a bunch of cells that just turned on and now we add the drug. And what happens is that these are the cells that survive. The ones that were on at the time of adding drug and the ones that were on and then turned off, they all died. Okay, so what that's saying is that this kind of random flip or this, you know, sort of slow switching back and forth really matters for the ultimate outcome of these cells. Now, in this case, we essentially through inspired guesswork picked that one gene, but you have 30,000 genes. So in general, how do you find the genes 
that are going to be important for this kind of behavior. I mean, which one should you, this is quite a laborious process, I should say, to uh, put in GFP on this. Actually, last year's speaker, uh, Feng Chang, who's done very amazing things, um, we've used some of his technologies to actually do this, but it, it's still hard, takes some time. Um, so you can't do this for all 30,000 genes, and it's hard enough to do one. Um, so what we've been doing is developing tools that allow us, essentially using Luria and Delbrook's original idea of sort of counting up the number of colonies or you know, whatever it might be, and looking for high variability. Um, we've been able to uh, adapt that. I won't go into the details of it, but um, we've been able to adapt that um, exact same methodology. But instead of counting colonies, we're able to count for all of these 30,000 genes. We can actually count the sort of expression level, if you will, um, of all of those genes. And then what we can do is for each of those genes, we can ask the question, are you heritable or not? Or are you associated with this sort of fluctuations? Um, and we're able to find all these genes. So I'm gonna be a little technical for a minute for those of you who are interested in these kind of things. Um, once you find all of these slowly fluctuating uh, genes, you can actually do uh, correlation analysis because this is all by RNA-seq. So we get this you know, genome-wide. Um, we can look at the expression of uh, particular um, sets of genes that seem to co-fluctuate, like co-regulated genes. Uh, we find this whole panel of known resistance markers that we know are fluctuating, so that was a really nice control showing that everything worked. And we're able to find new rare cell expression patterns that we never would have guessed, uh, that now we can find de novo using these sequencing-based approaches. So, um, sorry for the brief technical transgression, it's just cool. Anyway. Um, Okay, and we think that this same sort of behavior, you know, everything I've shown so far is in melanoma, but this same sort of behavior, uh, we believe, is also actually probably occurring across many different cancers. So here's an example of a triple negative breast cancer cells. Same sort of thing, although completely different drug, completely different mechanism of action. You add uh, taxol to these cells. Um, most of them die, uh, a couple live. What's different about those cells? And what we've been able to do is use this technique that allows us to sort of find all the genes that might be involved. Uh, and then what we can do is actually look at these cells and what we realize is that what looked again like a bunch of gray blobs in the microscope, uh, turns out to have a lot of variability. And if you're able to find the right cells, if you're able to find the right uh, programs that are randomly activated in some subset, those are the ones that go on to become resistant. OK. Um, there's something a little bit logically confusing about what I've been talking about so far, so I'll just uh, quickly explain that. So, um, so why don't cells uh, switch back and forth after you add the drug. Like, what happens? So, you know, I'm saying that the cells switch back and forth, then you add the drug, and then they become resistant, but why don't they just switch out of resistance if they're always switching back and forth? And what happens is actually uh, cellular reprogramming. Uh, what happens is that these cells, um, they have kind of randomly start flipping these knobs, and then once you add the drug, they say, okay, like, put all of these knobs on and, like, lock it and throw away the key. So these cells become now permanently resistant. We're still trying to figure out exactly how that process occurs. I think it's still quite mysterious. Um, but it's also, a, again, a very generic uh, sort of question. Um, this raises a very interesting question, which is, so everything I've been showing is about how uh, molecular state, the molecular state of a cell, like which of these genes are on or not, um, can predict cellular behavior. One of the things that we'd really like to do is go from the cellular behavior back to the initial molecular state. So I know there's this, these cells became resistant. Could I tell you what was different about those cells initially? Um, and you know what I've shown is that, yes, we were able to reveal that in this one particular case. But in general, this might be very difficult to do. So we can look at these cells later and ask, OK, well, I know what happened to these cells. These cells became drug resistant. I can tell you a lot of things about this. But none of what you learn about these cells later necessarily informs you anything about what was different about the cell to begin with. Um, and so what you really need is a cellular time machine. You need some way to be able to rewind the video tape, like, like go back in time and look and find like, oh, that's the cell that turned into these guys over here. Um, can you tell me what's different about those cells? And the thing that makes this difficult is this reprogramming process because the state of the cell over here can be very different than the state of the cell over here. Let me give you an example. Um, this is Obama 
2008, <laughs> Obama 2017, Clearly, he's been uh, reprogrammed by his time in office. Um, so what we really need is like a cellular time machine that allows us to say, okay, look over here, and then let's go back and find like the original promise. Um, <laughs> can we go back and find out what was so special about that guy to begin with? Um, the thing is that if you use something like hair color, you would never find him, right? Because now his hair is gray, but his hair used to be black. So if you were to go back in time and look for the gray-haired cells, you'd never find them. And this reprogramming is what makes this problem really difficult. In some ways, genetics is really handy because it's sort of a simple tie that binds. But now we're dealing with non-genetic things, so we have to invent a completely different tool set. So uh, the big problem with this is that we don't actually have time machines, right? This is not a thing that is physically possible, uh, at least as far as I'm aware. Um, so, so how are we gonna do it? And I'll actually, again, this is gonna be like a little nerdy, so I apologize, but um, it's, again, it's kind of cool. The idea basically is to uh, take a bunch of cells, so you have a bunch of uh, these, let's say, melanoma cells, and what we're gonna do is imprint upon each of them, even though they're genetically all the same, we're gonna put in our own DNA through a viral barcode, um, and we're going to barcode each of these cells. So now they each have their own code. So we have cells like A, B, C, D, or in this case, you know, orange, green, purple. And we're going to let them divide one time. So now I've got a bunch of sort of like identical twin cells up here. And then what I'm going to do is take half of those cells and keep them for later. So I'm going to like freeze them in time like Han Solo and the carbonite. And then the other cells, I'm going to take them and put them in drug. And then what's gonna happen is some of those cells are gonna grow out, so it turns out purple is the lucky winner. Now what we wanna do is go back and find the purple cell. So what we do is we actually, uh, so this is the nerdy part, sorry. Um, we sequence these, we find the barcodes that we integrated with the virus, and we actually make RNA fish probes. So these are uh, those probes that light up the different genes. Uh, we, make RNA fish probes specific to purple to find the purple cells. This is kind of a crazy experiment for those of you in the know because what you're doing is you're actually sequencing and then based on the sequencing, you're buying a bunch of probes to specifically pull out those cells, which is kind of wacky, but it works. Um, you do this and then the idea is you can then ask what was different about that purple cell, either through high put imaging, which I'm gonna show, um, but you can also, by the way, flow sort them and do RNA-seq and other biochemical assays, which allows you to get a genome-wide picture of what's different in these cells. Okay, so to give you a sense of the scale of the problem and why this is hard, um, the big issue is that you need to look at a lot of cells because the number of these resistant cells or the cells that are gonna do something different are very, very rare in this population. So we've got a 15 millimeter by 15 millimeter square of imaging here, um, about 100,000 cells. And of these, only about 10 of them are actually gonna be the ones that we're looking for. Um, but I'm pleased to report that you can actually do this and you can find these barcodes in these cells. You can find these rare cells that are the ones that are going to eventually become resistant. You can find these essentially uh, needles in the haystack. And in fact, if you find, so these are the cells to look at up here. These are the ones that we label with the barcode and we're able to, you know, pick them out, and then we can ask, do they express these other markets? So the genes that I showed you that are already there, like this is sort of just to show the whole thing works, we know these genes should be active in only these rare cells, and indeed, that's exactly what shows up. So we've looked at a few of these different genes. They only show up in those rare cells. Uh, it's just really cool, we're really excited. Because what this allows us to do is take any cellular behavior. So far, we've just been focusing on drug resistance, but you could imagine metastasis or non-cancerous things like reprogramming, all kinds of different things. Um, you can take this cellular behavior, a uh, um, behavioral difference in the cell, like drug resistance, and you can rewind back in time and find what was different about that cell initially that allowed that cell to do that. And just as another little uh, nerdy thing for uh, the scientists in the audience, um, what we found is that actually you can even do things, so what we find when you get drug resistant colonies, you'll find some sort of very resistant colony, like big ones, and then some small, less resistant colonies. And in fact, we can link that back to differences in the initial state, so uh, the ones, um, they all seem de-differentiated, but the ones that are sort of more activating MAP kinase uh, are the ones that seem to lead to bigger colonies in the end, uh, which is kind of wild. So um, I think that this is cool because it sort of opens up a brand new set of things. We're so conditioned, I think, with uh, genetics 
to look for genetics as the cause for everything. And it's a bit of this lamppost problem. So, you know, there's this uh, famous cartoon of um, the drunk looking for their keys under the lamppost. And they say, well, how do you know they're there? They're like, well, this is the only place I can look. And it's the same with genetics. Genetics is such a facile tool. We have so much uh, powerful genetics that we, we end up just looking for mutations all the time. But there are all these other parts of biology that we haven't been able to look at, and I think now we're starting to develop the tools that allow us to do that. Um, okay, so what can we do with this non-genetic view of drug resistance? Is this actionable in any way? I mean, ultimately what we want to do is solve the problem of resistance, so can we use this knowledge to do anything about that problem? Um, and I think the answer is yes, and the answer really lies in this video. So watch, again, this is the video where the cell turns on and off. Okay, so that cell turns on, and then it turns off, and it might turn back on at some later time. Because cells are turning on and off, what that suggests is that it's a biological process. That cells actually do something to turn on, and then do something else to turn off. So, Contrast this with this conventional Darwinian model where you get a mutation. Cells don't purposefully, in general, don't purposefully make mutations. They just happen, and there's nothing the cell can do about it. It just lives with it or dies with it or proliferates. Whatever it does, you get a mutation and you just deal with that. But if you have um, these non-genetic models where cells are sort of flipping in and out of the state, what that suggests is that there's a biological process that turns the gray cell into a green cell. And if we could somehow inhibit that process, maybe what we could do is actually get rid of the green cells so that if we add the drug, none of them are even available to become resistant because we've now blocked all of these cells from even forming to begin with. So this is, it's a simple, it, it doesn't seem that big a difference, but it's quite profound, actually, uh, that you can target the process and not the cell. Okay, how do we find out what controls these fluctuating cells? So, okay, sounds good. What do you actually do to actually figure out what makes these cells you know, turn on and off? Um, so, actually, what we've been using is this tool called CRISPR. Uh, one of the main people who developed it was last year's speaker, Feng Shang. Um, that's, like, such a big deal. <laughs> Just want to say. Uh, um, which I'm sure many of you have used CRISPR, but the idea that we've been using is that of a genetic screen to figure out what are the biological control knobs that tell cells to turn on and off. And the idea, roughly speaking, is use this molecular scissors to cut out basically every single gene, and in doing so, basically, uh, sort of sever the link that runs a particular biological pathway, and then see if any of those get rid of the cells. So it's not a really smart approach. I mean, it's smart in the sense that it, uh, it will give you an answer. Um, but it's not like, oh, I think it's this, I think it's that. It's just, let's just try everything and see what happens. So we did that. Um, I should say that doing this requires an enormous amount of work doing these genetic screens. I mean, this is a field, by the way, that I think has been revolutionized by CRISPR. I mean, being able to do uh, these genetic screens in human cells is just something that was not accessible before. So um, it's kind of an amazing thing. Still a lot of work, especially for these rare cell behaviors, and I'm happy to go into the details of how annoying this was before. By the way, these are 15 centimeter dishes, and this is for one screen, FYI, <laughs> a lot of work. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, so my student was uh, you know, watching World Cup while doing a lot of this. <laughs> but the bottom line is, you do this screen, you get a whole bunch of genes that if you cut them out, make the cells either more green or less green. They change the frequency by which cells are moving in there. So what that says is that yes, it's a biological process, and we can manipulate it. Uh, and in fact, we can even find drugs that if we add, we can, we can make more of these green cells, uh, or we can make less of these green cells, which is kind of cool. So now we're really starting to be able to turn the knobs that control the cellular plasticity. Um, and in fact, not only can we just control plasticity, but we can even get rid of resistance. So here's an example of cells. Um, it says no drug. Don't. Uh, worry about that, but basically, uh, these are melanoma cells. We add the drug, and we get these resistant colonies. So those, these are all these little patches that are showing up here. But if we give it, in addition, one of these other drugs that inhibits these green cells from forming, it does exactly what we were hoping it does, which is get rid of all of these resistant colonies, or at least many of them. So the idea would be that 
using these other uh, pathways that we've now started to figure out, maybe we can block this process of resistance. And actually, um, there's something interesting about this, which is that uh, because of the nature of the dynamics that you have cells moving in and out of these states, and then you add drug, and there's reprogramming, and so forth, um, the timing, the relative timing of when you add these different drugs or inhibit different pathways in the biology, um, can, we think, have a pretty profound effect on what ultimately happens. So here's an example of, this is a, one of the drugs that I showed you just before that increases the amount of green cells. What's interesting is that if you add that drug at the same time as an anti-cancer drug, you get no effect. Basically, it does nothing. But if you add it beforehand, basically, if you make a bunch of green cells and then try and kill everything off, then you get way more resistance. So what this is suggesting is that the timing by which we're adding these drugs could be really important uh, clinically uh, as well as you know, in the dish. So that, that's what we're hoping. And that's where I think one of the in areas that we're very interested in following up on. Um, OK, so if cellular variability, I'll just end with this question for which we have <laughs> no data. But if cellular variability is a biological process, does it play a role in normal healthy tissue? Uh, you know, what is it? it if there is some pathway there that controls the variability, uh, is it acting in normal tissue? And if so, why? Uh, we definitely have seen examples of these rare cells. These are in primary melanocytes. So these are uh, essentially the non-cancer cells that are there that turn into melanoma. But before their melanoma, you still find these cells doing this wacky stuff. So what that suggests is there are these cells even in normal tissue and they may have a biological function, but we don't know yet. That's one of the things we're very interested in trying to figure out. So, um, well, hopefully what I've been able to convince you um, is that there's a lot more to how our cells work and how we work than just our genes. Our genetics is not uh, pure destiny. Um, and I think that we're gonna learn a lot more about biology uh, by following um, these additional layers of cellular control beyond just uh, the genetics that I think we've come to know and love and that have sort of permeated the public discourse on this topic. Um, and I also want to end by saying that, you know, science is a deeply human pursuit. Um, I think every scientist has a story where they looked at the data and they thought everything was pointing one way and then they had to go back later and realize um, that actually, hey, look, there was no plate at, on this side of the dinner table. I was wrong about everything. This happens all the time, and that's the scientific process. We're constantly refining uh, what we think and sometimes tossing it out altogether. Um, and it's very interesting because you know, when you have these sorts of situations in science, uh, there's always a bit of faith. I think there are people who cling to ideas well beyond their lifetime. You know, they, strongly believe in something that's not actually true. But I think the big difference between science and faith is that eventually, hopefully, the evidence rules the day. Uh, and you know, we figure out, like, this is what really is going on here uh, you know, until the next thing comes along uh, to change that. Um, and I guess one message I would like to leave with is that you don't get to pick and choose what you believe with evidence. Uh, eventually, the evidence piles up, and I think especially these days um, when you know, people are constantly questioning uh, what, what people think are, is accepted as true, and I would say this is true uh, on, on both sides, um, I think that we just have to remind ourselves that you can't pick or choose uh, what evidence you believe or not. Evidence is evidence. So um, anyway, I would like to end there, and again, I really want to thank uh, the people now, especially uh, Ben, Sydney, Eduardo, just amazing scientists, like I said. Uh, I'm just so lucky to work with them. Um, many, many collaborators. Uh, I've been very lucky to work with Meanhart and Ashi, two uh, brilliant melanoma researchers. Uh, Junwei Shi, who's uh, our local uh, resident CRISPR Jedi at, uh, at Penn. Um, various other uh, collaborators and, and many funding sources. And thank you for your attention. That was terrific, thank you. Um, I just have a question about, <clears throat> in, in general, the types of changes that you see, are they 
largely the epigenetic changes that occur on the histones in terms of the modification of histones, DNA methylation, or there's some other factors that cause these genes to be turned on and off in terms of the transcription component. Yeah, um, fascinating question. We don't yet have an answer. I mean, what we can say is that if we look at expression of these like handful of genes, we know that uh, at least expression of the genes is associated with the change. If we look at the CRISPR screen, we can say the expression of some of those genes is causally relevant for those cells um, maintaining that state, let's say. Um, whether there's some upstream causative factor or downstream causative factor that's more sort of the, um, the new version of epigenetics, this sort of uh, you know, histone modification or whatever, we don't know. The big challenge there actually is that these cells are very rare and it's hard to isolate pure populations. So to find that signal using ChIP-seq or whatever uh, is, is hard. But I think with these barcoding, these sort of time machine techniques, we're really able to get very pure populations. So the hope is, that we can now actually ask exactly some of those questions. But I, I think it's right on, yeah. So that's really fascinating. And I love your time machine. Um, I feel like these barcodes are gonna revolutionize. Like what you're doing can be applied to lots of different tracings of finding different Obamas. Um, and yeah. very, <laughs> very, very powerful. Um, but so bacteria are really good at this too, right? They can go into this like hibernation state yeah. and some will become resistant and then switch back on. And they tend to do it with like pumps. I'm wondering, like they'll pump out the drug. I'm wondering if like in addition to this reprogramming state, do you see any of your, well, two part question, do any of your CRISPR hits hit pumps that could be pumping out the drug and or can you see non-coding elements in this? Is it, is it unbiased or is it only focused on mRNAs? Uh, the, so, okay, I'll answer the last part first. So the CRISPR screen was not genome wide. It was targeted specifically to, um, well, I mean, okay, so it was pretty broad. I mean, it targeted, all major kinase domains, all transcription factors, and then a bunch of epigenetic factors. So, um, but we didn't look at non-coding element or non-coding other types of regulation. So, um, what I can't so the transporter question is a really interesting one. Uh, we looked for like efflux pump, pump uh, efflux pump expression changes. Didn't really find anything in resistance, uh, and they didn't show up as CRISPR hits. So. That would suggest that the, the efflux pumps are probably not what's relevant for the mechanism of, mechanism of resistance in this case, but certainly they could be in others. The persister cell thing in bacteria is interesting and different in a very subtle way, which is that uh, the persister cells no longer divide typically once they move into that persistence state, whereas we see them continue to divide. Um, that actually has some implications in the type of experiments that you can do. Uh, but I, I think on some conceptual level, yes, it's very much the same sort of, same sort of thing. Hello. Hi. <laughs> that was really interesting. That was really great. I was oh, just wondering if you've seen or done any experiments with healthy cells with these unhealthy cells? Just because I know the environment, when you add, introduce drugs and introduce different cellular triggers can like drastically affect healthy cells as well. Yeah, so uh, we have not. That's a great experiment. Um, it would be totally doable and we just haven't done it, OK? <laughs> um, we have done a related experiment, which so many people believe that sort of the spatial context of cells and their organization matters a lot. And there's definitely a lot of evidence for that. So we spent a lot of time actually trying to see if that was happening in our system. So we would do things like add resistant cells on top of non-resistant cells and see if that would trigger the, you know, them jumping into the state. We did a lot of experiments that frankly all came up negative, which really suggests that whatever this is, is at least in our hands in our system, a cell autonomous feature rather than a uh, sort of instructed from the environment. Um, but that's not to say that it's sort of a, a soft no because there's, of course, other contexts that we have not looked at in which exactly that could happen um, and probably does taking the weight of the evidence. But we just haven't been able to figure out exactly how to study it yet. That's a really cool uh, public talk. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the question I have is of like in a, in a cell of all the genes that it's expressing, do all of them fluctuate or do you have a sense of what percent is actually fluctuating 
And what's the, um, the, the difference between on and off states? Is it like a few full or it's really just like completely shut off or not? And then kind of continuing from that, what about the protein? So you're looking at the gene, so yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, a multi-layered question. So uh, the difference between the off and the on cell at the mRNA level can be quite stark. So it can be from the average on most cells is you know one, two, three RNA, and then in the on cells it'll be 300. So it can be like a pretty big change. Um, that does uh, propagate to the protein level as far as we can see. So you know, for if you sort out the ones that are high with the protein, they're high in the RNA, and, and so on and so forth. So so that correspondence is pretty strong. Um, sorry, there's one other part to your question. Oh, do they co-fluctuate? So the answer is. Yes, and we're still trying to figure out exactly how much. Uh, so what we can say is that if they're positive for one marker, then they are, let's say, tenfold more likely to be resistant. But it's not one-to-one -one with being resistant. If they're positive for two markers, they might be 30-fold uh, more resistant. So basically, as you add more, as they're positive for more and more of these markers simultaneously, we believe we're getting closer and closer to whatever that uh, resistance state is that green state, the cell. Um, with time machine, we're able to now actually figure out exactly what that is. So once we've done the time machine, what we, re what we found is that yes, it's a very large number of these markers on at the same time in individual cells that at least is strongly associated with them becoming ultimately resistant. Uh, the interesting thing there is that um, within that, what we're finding is that there are gradations of how much of these genes or how many of these genes are on and to what level. And those gradations actually do correlate with ultimate outcome, meaning that the ones that are really resistant have uh, a different initial state, and the ones that are somewhat resistant have a somewhat more moderate initial state. So there's sort of a, a continuum and then a, th a sort of a soft threshold that gets dropped on that continuum. One of the things that we're very interested in is mapping that out. And actually our CRISPR screens allow us to uh, in some ways decouple and say, okay, how these pathways, do they change the threshold or do they change the distribution? And uh, we're, we're seeing some interesting effects there. It's very preliminary at this stage. So. Thank you for your talk. Um, y y the primary idea was resistance, but did you see any hypersensitivity and can we learn something about cells that are more easily uh, affected by the drug? Oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, we haven't looked at that. That's pretty fascinating. We should be able to do that using you know, time machine type approaches. So um, definitely it seems like you add the drug and uh, especially if you add it at different doses, you can kill off different percentages of cells, which by the way is an interesting question in and of itself, right? I mean. I'm, kind of telling you a lie in the sense that I'm saying there's like these gray cells and the green cells and the green cells live and the gray cells don't. Well, actually there's a continuum of between gray and green and there's a threshold in between. Where that threshold may lie, again, may depend on the, the dose of drug and maybe some are hypersensitive, uh, some are somewhat sensitive, some are, you know, as sort of completely insensitive. I think that uh, the sort of black and white picture is starting to fall apart as we're starting to uh, look at at these uh, phenomena um, work. In fact, that was our initial clue that it's like obviously not genetic. You can just look at the literature and it's like, well, it's very obviously not. Um, because if you change the percentage of, or the amount of drug and thus change the percentage of cells that survive, you're not changing the percentage of mutants. The percentage of mutants is always going to be the same. If, if they live or die based on the mutation, there's no way you can get a different percentage, but you do. Um, and I think it speaks to exactly what you're talking about. So I, I think those are the kind of things that we have to start puzzling out. I was just, uh, this is really good talk, thank you. I was wondering if you'd looked at the effects of cell cycle on the expression and how that fits into your, the development, the resistance or expression of these markers. Yeah, so, uh, we haven't looked into it super carefully, to be perfectly honest. Um, I would say that uh, we have actually, I mean, Sabrina probably knows more than me about all of this. Um, I would say that we don't see any major, 
no obvious connections. So if we look at our time lapses, it's not like, oh, whenever they're in this stage of the cell cycle is exactly when these, uh, let's say, markers turn on. Um, we, if we sort out these cells, we don't find any particular difference in, let's say, uh, cell cycle marker gene expression or anything like that. Um, that's not to say that there is no effect, uh, and I would say that we just have to actually figure that out, but um, it's not obvious that, I think the time scales of these fluctuations are probably many, many cell cycles. That's not to say that they're not having some effect on that as well. Uh, we just haven't looked, I think, carefully enough. Um, we have not synchronized them. I mean, we can sort of like in silico synchronize them by saying, okay, expression of this marker gene uh, is on. That means we know they're in, let's say, early G1 or late G1 or whatever. And then we can say, does that have some effect or is that in any way correlated with the expression of these marker genes? The answer is no. Um, again, that's not like a hard no. So there's, I think, many, there's still many scenarios in which cell cycle could have effect. Uh, it's just not, uh, it's not immediately obvious that that would be uh, definitely the case. Hey, sure. Um, the barcoding thing again, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, but I had a question yeah, like about it. that. Uh, um, when you say, so you introduce a barcode, it, that's a genetic thing, right? Yes. Um, so. Can that itself be fluctuate? I mean, can the expression on that barcode itself be fluctuated and turn on and off? And can you actually identify, or can you say for sure that the barcode is always going to be expressed and not suppressed? Because if that itself is suppressed, then you can't trace your. Yeah, it'd be really thing. annoying if the barcode turned off, right? So, um, <laughs> yes, it does turn off. Uh, you know, cells do weird things. What can you do? Um, <laughs> we try and uh, we tried to pick one that was expressing at a pretty high level in most cells. Uh, there definitely are some fluctuations. I mean, when we do the sequencing at the DNA level, I mean, it's in there or it's not, uh, so we can find it. At the RNA level, I would say that generally they tend to express fairly robustly. And even if the expression level is, you know, variable between, let's say, dozens to hundreds, we're still able to pick it out, we think, with the time machine approach. Uh, so hope it is a technical issue. Um, it doesn't seem to be a major concern so far. Uh, but certainly something to watch out for because yes, they can be silenced. Because paradigm wise, I mean, if if you want to like introduce a paradigm saying that these uh, the genes can fluctuate in terms of their expression, but you have this class of genes that don't fluctuate, then it's it's still a kind of stone in your shoe for the, for the shift in paradigm. So yeah, I know. Uh, so um, so it's. Very interesting because actually, you know, I've been in this like single cell variability field for a depressingly long time. Um, <laughs> what I can say is that uh, for a lot, the people have been looking at the cellular variability, this non-genetic fluctuations for uh, for a long time, and it was very hard to connect it with anything that mattered. So, okay, there's some number of cells uh, of genes. Okay, got thirty thousand genes. I would say the vast majority of them do not show meaningful fluctuations from cell to cell. Then there's a fair number of genes that do show large fluctuations, but those fluctuations don't matter. And then there's, within that, I think this narrow set of genes that show fluctuations that do matter for how the cell behaves. It's not just an error bar, but it leads to all these differences that I've been showing. And uh, part of what we've been doing that I sort of glossed over um, is this idea of being able to find that subset of genes that sort of slowly fluctuates. We think that's really important, this coherency uh, that allows them to ultimately influence cell fate. So we actually have a preprint on this. Uh, it's called Memory Seek. You can look it up. Um, and, and we sort of outline that approach. Uh, it's based on the Luria Delbruck experiment that I sort of quickly went through. Thank you. Hey. Um, great talk. So the, it looks like the genes that came out of your screen and the drugs that you used uh, that eliminate the green cells are primarily histone um, modification inhibitors. So is that just a generic solution to this problem, or were you, were you able to find something that's very specific to the AXL NGFR pathway, so you could just target that pathway rather than treating a whole patient with a histone modification inhibitor? Yeah, I mean, that's, okay, well, Okay, they're the hits from our screen, which tend to actually be, well, okay, 
I didn't get into the details. We actually ran two different screens. So one was for just pure resistance and one was for variability. And it's interesting to sort of cross compare the two um, for reasons I won't get into here. But um, what we found is that the hits actually span a broad range of, uh, of potential targets. So there are a lot of hits that are transcription factors. There are a lot of hits that are signaling pathways. There are a lot of hits that are epigenetic factors and so forth. Um, the issue is what can you drug? And you just can't drug the transcription factors. So, and the signaling hits, um, some of them showed some effect. And, and we've actually even shown some of them before, like EGFR inhibitor can also inhibit resistance and in certain ways. It ends up clinically being toxic, the, that particular combination. Uh, perhaps for these reasons, I'm not sure. Um, so I guess I wouldn't read too much into the fact that we, I, I showed a few examples of those, except that they happen to be ones for which we could drug, uh, which sort of biases, I think, the interpretation maybe. But I, we had a range of hits that spanned a bunch of different classes of things. In fact, it was sort of hard to narrow it down even to particular signaling pathways, it seems like. You know, there's a lot of hippo pathway stuff. Um, as well as you know, MAP kinase, obviously, and, and various other kind of hits all over the place. So, uh, so, so, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't read too much into that. But yes, there were some uh, epi epigenetic factors that seemed to to play a role, a causal role. Uh, sort of a philosophical question. Um, so we didn't exactly evolve to uh, be resistant to cancer drugs. So yes, that's absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. So do you think that this system of this fluctuation plasticity serves a different purpose that in, in doing our normal lives and perhaps in regeneration that capabilities that we've lost as species? Or what can you speculate on that? Um, yes, I would love to. That's a great question. So it's, uh, it's, and I think very profound, actually. So yes, these cells did not evolve to become melanoma and then be resistant to vemurafenib, which <laughs> has been around for 10 years. <laughs> you know what I mean? These, there's absolutely no selective pressure on that. So what that suggests is that these cells enter into the state that, in fact, we've shown is sort of multi-drug resistant. It's, it's a generally resistant, resilient, robust state. Um, the question is, why aren't all cells in that state? Uh, and I think that there are probably some trade-offs that we don't fully understand as to why not all cells are in that state. I do think, OK, we find these cells even in normal tissues, or at least some data that we have suggests that. Um, Suppose for a minute that that actually matters for how the tissue works. Uh, one possible role could be that if you, you, know, you get a wound, these cells are the responders. They're the ones that can reprogram into that wound area. In fact, this happens uh, in, in many different wounding scenarios. Um, you know, finding the particular cells that do it uh, is, I think, an interesting question. Now, the question, uh, a follow-up question to that could be, why choose this strategy? Why not just have cells respond to the wound in general, like have all your cells be exactly the same and have uh, all, of, like, you know, all of your cells are capable of responding to the wound. Um, I don't know why that might not be a good thing. Uh, you can kind of guess answers, but you know. There's another question, which is, well, why not have a subset of stem cells or something within there that would always repopulate the wound? Why have all your cells be capable of doing it, sort of fluctuating in and out? Actually, the answer to that, I think, from a design perspective, is uh, akin to this Luria Delbrook experiment that I showed with the kangaroos. Um, the idea being that, look, if you want to maintain a steady fraction of your population to respond, let's say 1%, then having this random strategy of doing that is actually a really good one, where every cell moves in and out, on average, you're going to get about 1%. But if you have one cell that's like always the responder, and it can divide and make more responders, and you have other cells that are not responders, and they divide, the problem is that you're going to get sometimes this huge population imbalances where you end up with one tissue with a ton of responders and one tissue with almost no responders. So this fluctuating approach actually ends up, it's, it's sort of a robustness through variability. Uh, which I think is an interesting concept and probably quite general uh, in biology, although I think we're just now starting to wrap our minds around that in the community. So.
So, <laughs> I'm, <off. laughs> I'm an outsider to your field, so my question or remark may be off the mark. But uh, you know, you have this selection process. You have a group of very high variability cells, and then by some process, you reduce them to a smaller number, and then refine them further to a smaller number yet, which are the most aggressive. And uh, all of that is related in some way to the variability, right? On-off things going on. Mm -hmm. So on-off uh, means there's a time dimension to that. So there's a frequency to on-off. And I'm just wondering if maybe there can be a selection process that is related to a particular frequency of this turning on and turning off, like a Fourier transform, you know? So. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the things that's very challenging is to try and actually measure these on and off times. It's just technically difficult. We think that the on off times are on the order of days. So if you were to say, like, what's the sort of coherence time, it's, it's quite long, actually. Um, although, I mean, we're alive for a long time, so I don't know if days is long or short. Uh, there's a lot of theoretical work out there actually relating uh, the, the autocorrelation time of fluctuations to um, what type of environmental fluctuations are they most uh, or best suited to respond to? So if you have a fluctuating environment and you have fluctuating cells and certain cells are uh, more, uh, more fit in certain environments than others, then essentially what, what I think the result, roughly speaking, is that the, correla the correlation times need to roughly match. And that's actually the most optimal, although there's some sort of fudge factors depending on sort of the details of the model. But roughly speaking, that's about what it is. So it's interesting looking at this, that if we could actually measure these autocorrelation times, in a way, maybe that's telling us about what biology expects the, um, the fluctuation time of the environment to be uh, in order to match that. But again, I think that's very much supposing that that's the um, sort of causative reason for why that particular autocorrelation time uh, has been selected. But at, at this point, I would say we just have so little idea of what the times are, especially in, in normal tissue, that, uh, that I, I would say it's still just kind of blind speculation at this point. But. Oh, I was just wondering, um, I really liked your idea on the time machine thing where you separate it and you freeze it. But I'm just wondering if it's possible that when you freeze it, you could possibly damage the internal functioning of the cell and then it affecting your data as a result. Oh, yeah. So it turns out that when we freeze the cells, we actually kill them. So the <laughs> these cells are dead. Um, they're kind of like frozen. Um, and so, yeah, we have to do everything on dead cells. And in fact, um, I mean, they're dead, so we can't see what they would do after that. Uh, but beyond that, also, just the technical process of uh, fixing the cells um, to, to kill them, the way that we kill them, can damage some of the molecules in there, which makes it difficult to read it out. But I, I think we've overcome uh, most of those headaches, basically. But, uh, but yeah, it's very much the case that um, on top of the fact that they're dead, there's also, they're like super, they're dead and messed up. And so we have to somehow uh, account for that as well. well I'm, I think un unless your mother has a public comment that she would like to make, <laughs> and it sounds like she does. <laughs> so Allison, you might be a little closer. Okay. No, no, after, talk's over. <laughs> <laughs> after this one, I think then we'll... Um, if your target audience was your non-scientific mother, then I think you have achieved your, uh, what you set out to do, because I did understand everything you said, or nearly everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ma. That, that truly is a rare event, so. <laughs> so thank you very much for a really wonderful public lecture. Oh, thank, thank you, all, you for coming. all for coming, and we have a reception where we can ask more questions and mingle outside.